Hi, this is Steve Smith. Welcome to this Pluralsight On Demand module on the Don't Repeat Yourself principle. The Don't Repeat Yourself principle, or DRY, is one of the fundamentals of object-oriented design and software engineering. And personally, I think that this is one of the most important principles for every developer to learn. In this module, we'll start out by defining the Don't Repeat Yourself principle, and then we'll go through a demo showing how misuse of this principle results in spaghetti code that's very difficult to maintain. After a little bit of analysis, we'll go through a series of demos showing how we can refactor such code to dry it up and make it much easier to maintain and continue to use. We'll briefly look at some code generation options before moving on to show what repetition in your process can do and how it adds to the waste of your process. And then we'll show a quick demo of how we can automate our process to apply dry as well. Finally, we'll wrap up with the summary and related fundamentals. If you've been following this series, you probably know that I like these motivational posters. This one I produced myself, and as you can see, it shows the punishment for repeating yourself should be something like repeating yourself at the chalkboard. I do believe that repetition is the root of all software evil, and that most of the major problems and bugs that crop up in, in software or that make it more difficult to maintain could be avoided through the proper use of the don't repeat yourself principle. This principle was first coined in the Pragmatic Programmer book and stated as every piece of knowledge must have a single unambiguous representation in the system. Note that these pieces of knowledge are not just values, but they might also be processes or algorithms or approaches to problems and abstractions in your application. In the book, 97 Things Every Programmer Should Know, I noted that repetition in logic calls for abstraction, repetition in process calls for automation. Variations of the dry principle include once and only once, as well as duplication is evil. Now let's take a look at a demo of a simple data warehouse example that I wrote, which violates dry all over the place, and then we'll see how we can clean this up by applying this principle. In this sample application, we have a data warehouse loading program, which we're calling Extract Transform Load, or ETL. ETL is a common pattern in data warehousing. If you do a search for that pattern, you'll find a number of commercial products that focus on data warehousing solutions. In this case, the basic steps that we want to apply is to extract some data from our data source, perform some kind of aggregation or transformation on that data, and then load this into our summary tables or our data warehouse and then finally finishing up the program. In this example, I'm going to be talking to the Northwind database, as you can see here in my hard-coded connection string. My extract method is going to open up a SQL connection, perform a query against invoices, and put that data into an invoice table. It's going to do some logging and output what it's doing as it goes. Then it's going to open up another connection, also to Northwind and it's going to query the employees and store this information in an employee table. As it goes, it'll write out the results. In our transform step, we're going to first take that list of shippers that we loaded in the load section, or in the extraction method, and we're going to go through each one of these shippers, get a count of them, and then basically take out the sum of the freight that that shipper received over the period of time that we loaded. When we're done, we'll also calculate the total freight from that period of time as well. Next, we'll go and analyze the employees. We'll pull out whether or not that employee is a manager based on how many employees report to that employee. And then we'll calculate the bonus for each employee based on that calculation of whether or not they're a manager. Finally, now that we have all of our data, we're prepared to load it back into our data warehouse. So we'll have to open up another connection. In this case, we're talking back to the same data source, but in a real system, it would likely be a different one. We'll clean up any data that was already there, and then we'll insert our records with our new summary data. We'll do the same thing for the employees, cleaning up what was there, and then inserting new records for their bonuses. You can see that this set of code is about 200 lines of code, and the only classes in it are our main program class here, 
as well as a class for freight by shipper, which simply shows the shipper name and the freight that they uh, charge during that period. And then for employees, these employees simply have the name, whether or not they're a manager, and their bonus. If we run this code, we'll see that it all executes. It finishes up in not too much time, and you can see that it logged all of the things that we expected it to out to the console. Now let's see what we can find as violations of the don't repeat yourself principle in this code and what we can do to correct it. A very quick analysis of the code shows a number of problems with the don't repeat yourself principle. These can be broken out into the following bullet points. The first one is the use of many magic strings or values throughout the code, followed by duplicate logic showing up in many different locations. There's repeated if-then logic in some branches of the code, as well as the use of conditionals instead of polymorphism. There are some repeated execution patterns where the same couple of lines or several lines of code are executed with some slight variation over and over again. And there's a lot of duplicate, most likely copy-pasted code that we can probably find with an automated tool and clean up. We have only manual tests in the code at the moment, and there are a lot of static methods, which we'll see can also prove to be problematic. There are quite a few examples of magic strings or values in this code. The first one is the use of the connection string being hard-coded throughout the code. Obviously, this is not a good practice and something that we should move to a more secure location, perhaps, and in any event, a single location that defines our connection strings for this application. Formatting strings are also specified in many different locations, as well as these blocks of for each logic to dump things to the console. If at some point we want to change how this data is formatted, or if we wanted to change where it's being displayed, these would need to be updated in many different locations. Another section is uh, using magic numbers. In this case, the number one is specified in multiple locations here without any indicator of why it is significant. And again, there's the use of formatting strings here that are repeated in multiple locations. Let's look at how we can apply dry to remove magic strings. We're going to look at applying the dry principle to remove some magic strings and values from our application. We've analyzed it and found that we have a number of cases where we're setting this connection string over and over in our code. We'd like to move that to a single unambiguous location that defines the connection string for the application. One option would be to move this to connection strings. We would do this by adding configuration manager which we'll have to add a reference to. So we'll add a reference to .NET system.configuration. And Configuration Manager has a connection string section where we could specify a name for this. We'll call it the main connection string dot connection string. Now in order for this to work, we'll also need to add a new app config value. And within our app config, we'll add a connection string section with a new connection string. We'll paste in the actual connection string we're using. And we'll also give it a name. By doing that, we can delete this one here and run our code since we have no actual tests. And if it still seems to work, then we can be confident that that's working. However, if we go through and add this logic that specifies the use of configuration manager everywhere that we're using a connection string in this code, we'll simply have changed one kind of duplication in exchange for another. Because now, if we later decide to change what that name of that value is for main, or if we decide to use a different method of storing the connection string or passing it into this method, we're going to have to change this in many different locations. So we've improved where the value of the connection string is stored. That's no longer repeated. It's only in one place here. But we haven't gotten rid of the repetition in how we get to that connection string. 
We can do that by simply pulling that method up to a class level variable. So we'll say string connection string equals this value. And we'll replace this with this. And now there's a refactoring that we can use here where we can introduce this as a field called underscore connection string. And now we're using that underscore connection string field. And if we move this initialization code up here to the beginning of our main method, we can then use underscore connection string throughout for all of our connection strings. I think that's all of them. So now if we run the code again, it should still work. And it does. And at this point, we can see that we've pulled out a fair bit of repetition into this one line that now aggregates all of that information in one place. Another thing that we saw when we analyzed our code was the frequent use of two things, one being this console write line, another being the use of this format string. And in fact, this entire for each loop is somewhat repetitive. As you can see, we're doing it both for our invoice table here, as well as down here for our employee table. We could apply an extract method refactoring in order to pull this data out and give us a, a common way to write it out. If we want to pull out this logic for writing out a number of rows inside of a data table, rather than working at the row level, we can simply create a new method that takes in the table and dumps out the results using this kind of format. We'll start off by creating this new method. And at this point, we simply want to take the logic we had before, for instance, this for each loop, and convert it so that it's using our table. However, we want it to work over the number of columns that the table has. So we'll do something like this. We've added in a bit of logic here that will determine what the total number of columns is, and then loop through those columns, adding in the row with that column index, and then a hyphen between each one, and finally a right line at the end if we don't have any more columns. This will dump out all of the columns in the table. If we want to actually limit this, because for instance our actual usage up here is perhaps only showing a certain number of columns, three, even though it's selecting all the columns in the table. We can pass in a column count. So int columns to display, let's say. And we'll use that here in place of column count. So instead of just table.columns.count, we'll say it's going to be that. But if columns to display is greater than zero and less than column count, we'll say column count equals columns to display. And then we can delete this old console write line that we had before and use our output table method now in place of these locations here. So we'll say output table, and we'll pass in invoice table, which we want to show three columns. And we can have our uh, columns to display have a default value if we want to, so we'll make that zero, equal zero. And that'll let us pass in nothing for it when we use it down here for our employee table. Now if we run this, it hopefully will still work. And it does, and if we scroll way to the top, well, we'll have to turn off some of our logging here to make this easier. <laughs> 
let's just do our load and run to show these are all the invoices being output and at the end these are our customers our employees rather so you can see it is still working the way it did before we have our hyphen separated columns the next magic value that we had in our application appeared in our transform section where we're doing these if statement checks and we're check checking whether the count was greater than zero and then we're grabbing the first item and if the count was greater than one then we're going to grab the second item which has index one and this number one here is the same as this number one here and this number one over here and so we could do a simple change to say something obviously we could fix this in several ways but the simplest change here to remove that magic number is to have something like int index which we'll set to one and then replace those ones with our index value now if we need to change that even if it's a copy paste change we won't forget one of those ones when we do it down here and we have these twos instead we'll see how we can clean up those if statements in a separate refactoring then the other thing that we have here is a format string this is for formatting numeric values decimals in this case if we want to pull that out it would simply be a matter of creating a new value we could create it here for instance and then anywhere we want to display that decimal format string or we want to use it rather we would just replace it here and here and here with that format string alternately this method of doing this right line could be extracted out into its own method in fact this entire chunk of if logic could be extracted into its own method or its own separate loop that does this work but uh, again that's a separate exercise so at the moment we've pulled out a number of magic strings we've eliminated the connection string duplication we've shown how we can output an entire table rather than having repeated loops for displaying rows we could apply that same logic in other places in our code where we're doing looping and doing output to the console. And lastly, we've looked at some display format strings and shown how we can easily replace those with a variable in our application. We see that our application has duplicate logic in multiple places. For instance, there's this logic here for specifying how to output data to the console, as well as separate locations where we're opening up a connection. Let's look at how we can apply some refactorings to clean this code up as well. We'll start with a fresh copy of our original solution. Here's our code. And we can see that we have our connection strings duplicated as we did before. And we have logic here for dumping things out to the console, which we would like to replace with a single new method. We also have a number of different places where we're doing this connection logic to open up a connection and get back a data table. We're doing that twice here, as well as down here in the fill section, we're opening up a connection, executing a query, and in this case we're doing an execute non-query call. And we're doing that a couple of times. In fact, we're doing it four times just in this one method. Now we can extract out this code ourselves or there are a number of well-proven tools that will do this for us. Let's look at an example tool. The simplest tool would be to add a Northwind data context using link to SQL. So we're going to go add a new item. We're gonna use a link to SQL class. We'll call it Northwind. We'll go over to our server explorer and we'll drag on the tables that we're interested in and Let's see, we also wanted employees and invoices. We'll set up the uh, property for this. We'll say that our entity namespace should be entities and everything else looks good. Now, if we look at our code, the first thing we're gonna do is delete a freight summary. So instead of using a connection, we're gonna say using var db equals new Northwind data context. 
And because we don't have our configuration set up for our connection string, we'll just hard code it for now. And within this data context, we want to first grab the one that we want to delete. So our shipper to delete is going to be from shippers in db.freight summaries, where shippers.name equals the individual shipper in our loop that we're on, dot name, and the date, the run date equals eight time dot today. We're gonna select the whole record. And we just want the first one. So we'll grab that and for our first, we'll do that here. We'll say db dot freight summaries, delete on submit, shipper to delete dot first. And we'll go ahead and submit this now. That takes care of this big chunk of code here. Next, we want to insert a new record with the run date and the values from our shipper that we're on. So for that, we'll do basically the same thing. We'll say our shipper to insert is a new freight summary. Now this is our entity freight summary that linked to SQL just created for us. And we will say that it's freight is our shipper freight and its name is our shipper dot name and its run date is still date time dot today. And then we want to just do an insert on this. So it's DB freight summaries insert shipper to insert db submit changes and if we apply this now to this logic here this is our using statement you can see it becomes much smaller at this point and we should be able to run our code and it should work and it still does We would do the exact same thing here, but for the sake of time, we won't show that to you. And so that's an example of how we could use link to SQL in order to eliminate a lot of repeated ADO.NET code. We're still gonna see some repetition in this pattern where we're looping through each one of these and doing some kind of a delete followed by some kind of an insert. And we could certainly eliminate that duplication as well using a different refactoring technique. The other duplicate logic that we saw was this output logic up here where we're looping and dumping out this stuff. We actually clean that up in our magic string section, but just for the sake of completeness, we'll show that technique here as well. If we go and we add a method to output the table here, then we can refactor these calls so that they simply say output table with our table name and the same thing here for our invoices. Taking care to change this, and we only wanna show three columns for the invoice one. And if we run this, you can see that we're still getting, here are our employees, and here are our invoices being output as expected. So we've done that refactoring. Let's look at the next one. Another symptom of violations of the don't repeat yourself principle that we see in our code is this repeated if then logic. In this case, we can see that we're simply checking whether or not the count is a certain value in order to ensure that we are able to write out the value to our table. Let's look at how we can clean this up. So this logic occurs within our transform method, where the first thing that we're doing is grabbing this invoice table and loading it with the, uh, the values that we want into our freight shipper list. So for each row, we're adding a value. And then we're checking to see if our list has a certain count. We wanna go and calculate the freight for that particular entry 
and specify it here. And then if it is another count greater than one or a count greater than two, we're gonna do this. And you can imagine that if we had dozens and dozens of uh, shippers, we would end up with many, many instances of this particular if-then block. This can be replaced quite easily with a loop. In fact, it could all be done inside the loop that we already have up here, where instead of specifying uh, what we're doing in a separate if block, we can just extract out a method for it and say here that the freight by shipper, well, first we'll pull out the, the actual entity that we want. So we'll say var my shipper equals, and we'll grab this new value here that we want. And I'm sure there's a refactoring that'll do that for me. And we'll put in my shipper there. And then the only other thing we need to do is say that my shipper dot freight equals calculate freight for shipper. And we'll pass in what do we need? The name. So my shipper dot shipper name and as well the invoice table, which we have a reference to. So we'll do this. We'll generate this method. And at this point, we simply copy out the guts of our if then logic here, paste that into our new method here and say that we're going to return this calculation here. And we really only need the shipper name at this location here. So that lets us do our computation and eliminates the need for this block. Now we want to write it out. So we want the shipper name as well as the result. And we can just return the result. That allows us to eliminate all of these if checks by doing all that work inside of this one loop, which now is one line of code. So we've reduced our total lines of code significantly. We're taking advantage of a loop that we already had. If we didn't have this loop, we could have simply created our own loop that looped through each of the uh, freight by shipper list entries to do this work as well. But it's very com common refactoring to be able to take a number of uh, if statements and replace them with some kind of a loop. And so now we should be able to run this application and everything still works as it did before. Another violation that we have to the don't repeat yourself principle is caused by this conditional instead of polymorphism. Here we see an example of the flags over objects anti-pattern where it's violating the tell don't ask principle, which is also known as the dependency inversion principle because we're asking this particular object whether or not it's a manager, and then using that to compute the bonus ourselves within this external calling code and setting it in a field within the employee object. Let's look at how we can refactor this to make it apply the dry principle and make it use the polymorphism instead of this if-then logic that will eventually be scattered throughout our code. So let's look at our employee class. We can see that it has this Boolean for whether or not it's a manager. We can take that out of there and create a new class using inheritance. We can create a manager class that is an employee. And then the other thing we can do is we can create, an, as well as this bonus, we want to be able to calculate the bonus based on the freight that's passed in, in our case. So we'll create a public decimal uh, set bonus, let's say. And let's make this one only support get. Bonus is protected and we have a set bonus method that takes in freight used for bonus. 
and we want to make this virtual. And then we will say for an employee that bonus now equals freight used for bonus divided by a thousand. But for a manager, we'll override that. And we'll simply say that bonus is equal to the freight divided by 10. That was our logic that we used before. And this can actually be void, it turns out, because it's doing all the work. Now we simply need to be able to create things as managers or employees as appropriate in our code. So if we look back at our program, here, we're gonna say that we get a new employee and then based on whether or not it's got this particular row value, we're gonna set it to something or the other. We could certainly create a factory method of some sort that takes in this row data and generates the correct class for us. But in this case, we can simply move these things around. We'll say var employee, actually we'll say employee, employee here. And then we'll specify in our if statement that employee equals new manager. with a name equal to row zero dot two string. And that's all we really need. Otherwise, we can pull this block here and say that we equal a new employee using our, our block we just snagged. and add them. Now that doesn't change this logic significantly. Let's see, there we go. But our for each logic now makes more sense because now instead of having to do this check and ask, this is a violation of the tell don't ask principle because what we're doing is we're saying, I'm gonna ask this whether or not it's a manager and then I'm going to set something on it. And so this is a very common anti-pattern that you want to avoid. Instead, we want to just let our object do what it's responsible for, and it should be responsible for calculating the bonus in this case. Or we could create another object that does it, but certainly our main program shouldn't be doing this logic. So now we can simply call employee.setBonus, and we need to pass it in what the total freight value was, and all the rest of this can disappear. And that eliminates some repeated logic where throughout our code we might be doing this inspection of whether or not an employee is a manager or not and doing some kind of different behavior based on that. Using inheritance and polymorphism, we're able to apply this right here in such a way that it does that generally and we can use that same pattern throughout our code. If we run the code, we see that we still get the same results that we got before. Here you can see managers get 20 grand, employees get $207, which is what we had to begin with. This wraps up part one of the don't repeat yourself principle, one of the fundamentals of software engineering and a principle of object-oriented design. To summarize, repetition breeds errors and waste. You want to try and refactor your code to remove repetition using a number of known refactorings, design patterns, and principles. I mentioned two books that I recommend. The first one is The Pragmatic Programmer from Journeyman to Master, available at the URL shown here, and 97 Things Every Programmer Should Know, available at this URL. Thank you very much. This has been the Don't Repeat Yourself Principle, part one by Steve Smith for Pluralsight On Demand. Stick around and view part two, where we'll show some additional refactorings of the code that we were looking at, as well as show how we can apply the dry principle to processes in addition to just code.